So, Nuclear Information and Resource Service is in its 40th year. We were founded by people in 1978, right before Three Mile Island, uh, who already knew that fission was not the way to make electricity. So I know there's a diversity of views in this conference and, and in organizations, but Nuclear Information and Resource Service is the most anti-nuclear funded group in the United States. So I'll make no apology for the fact that we take great pride in the fact that 10 years ago there were close to 30 proposals for new reactors. Today there are only two under construction and we're pretty darn confident that those two in Georgia are never going to be completed uh, despite the bluster. They are AP1000s. The parent company Westinghouse has brought its parent company Toshiba to the brink and uh, I know that these are now uh, potent issues for the UK. I'm sorry I haven't done my homework. I didn't know I was coming to Scotland, so I can't really tie all those pieces together, but I can certainly refer people to people in the United States um, who I work with. Plus, I was the intervener on the only greenfield site of the close to 30 new reactor proposals that was the, the nuclear renaissance that was being promoted uh, soon after the beginning of the millennium, and it is now clearly done gone by in the United States. And uh, they are now trying to, anyway, the Greenfield site, on my very birthday in May, the uh, nuclear license that we were challenging was actually awarded, but no construction had started. The license was going to sit there for up to 20 years, and possibly if the carbon situation changed to change the economics, then that site might have been built under that license. But just last month, the owner, Duke Energy, withdrew permanently the license, had it canceled on my birthday. So it was a very nice birthday gift. <laughs> okay, so now a quick update. I think the thing I want to focus in on the most is waste. Um, but before I go there, I need to mention that this whole notion of baseload energy is being used at every level in the United States to try and engineer ways either for utility corporations to charge more if they're generating coal or nuclear. They are bunching those two together. They found out that that's not working out so well for the nuclear side. So now they're actually trying to construct equations that would just benefit nuclear as a baseload generation, either for being able to charge their customers more uh, have state level taxation to compensate, which quite frankly, if you're charging your customers for something that's not a service and it's more, yeah, it's kind of a delegated tax, you know. So taxation of customers or now there's proposals for federal and state level actual taxes to pay to keep nuclear reactors online that were scheduled to close due to aging, due to uh, high cost of replacement parts. We're now into a, a sphere in the United States where we are moving past the safety regulators own recommendations for closure on the basis of politics and I think it's very very bad precedent. We are fighting very hard to ensure that this does not happen. Um, you know with the climate thing we kind of went from shut them all down tonight or last night or last year to okay it's a process we need to be turning off coal at the same time so maybe it's a step by step but now there's a complete reversal on um, the policy level at the federal level. Obviously, we have a different administration, and um, we're ha having to fight very hard. We also lost Harry Reid, which is very key. He was the Senate Majority Leader from Nevada, and I'm now going to switch to discussing the waste issue. Um, Jill showed the book about Yucca Mountain. Um, it is the one site in the United States that is slated for the digging down and making a big hole uh, with little shoots off the side and burying the waste. Well, right now there's a tunnel that's exploratory tunnel in this thing that's just consolidated uh, ash, volcanic ash, out in Nevada. And uh, it's not qualified for waste. It was chosen politically. Uh, President Obama set it aside, said it's off the table, but he didn't officially cancel it. So we're in this incredible limbo position where the thing has had no money. Uh, there's a lot of people who understand it's a bad site, but now we have no big Harry Reid lion in the Senate to stop uh, legislation and we're in a very precarious position because in addition to trying to get Yucca Mountain back up and running, which is a commitment by some people in the United States and the industry and 
some specialists, although very few. Um, they now want to put up consolidated storage sites. And there's two in particular, one in Texas and one in New Mexico. And the way those states fit together, I'm sorry, I don't have a map, but they're 20 miles apart in two different states. And interestingly enough, they are the cask, the container makers who are promoting this idea. They own the sites, and one of them is none other than Arriva. And it has a new name. It's come to the United States. It's reincorporated. Its parent company is bankrupt. But in the United States, it is now called Orano. It sounds like a cookie, Pepperidge Farm, perhaps. Um, but Orano and the owner of a so-called low-level radioactive waste site are teaming up, and they want to have waste at this one site. And 20 miles away is another cask maker, which has, I'm sorry, I don't have the corporate structure to show you, but it has ties to uh, British nuclear fuels. So. As the waste processing process, reprocessing process in the Europe has gone down, unfortunately, we see the same corporate players coming to the United States, propagating the idea that we should move the waste now because there's so many sites that are closed that have the waste sitting there. It's called orphaned and stranded. And it's, these are reactor sites. They're licensed. They have security. They are near populations. but. You know, if you could split atoms there, you ought to be able to have highly radioactive waste sit there for the interim, not forever, but, you know, as a decade scale thing, they've been doing it, but now they're promoting this idea of putting it on trucks and trains and taking it to Texas and New Mexico and low income, high Spanish speaking populations, um, but even more worrying, near the reprocessing center of the U.S. federal government, Sandia. So I personally feel that we are on the brink of seeing a reprocessing revival in the United States. Um, most of my colleagues who work on nuclear proliferation, not worried, not worried, not worried, not worried, go talk about it in China, not worried. Um, but yeah, I'm worried. So maybe it's not in my term of, of tenure. I'm pleased and proud to report I'm in my 27th year of work for Nuclear Information and Resource Service. And, beginning to think about moving on into the other stuff I've been talking about, but um, there's now a commitment in our organization to revive the grassroots network because our rooms are even whiter and higher in age than this room. So a lot of my work now is outreach to younger people, people in the impacted communities, people along the transport routes. We do not oppose the movement of waste. But we definitely support the idea of moving it once. If you're going to move it at all, move it once with a very clear reason that it's going to be more beneficial at the end point than where it is now. Um, so we're organizing on the transport issue, educating local officials. And let's see, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, but I was asked to do the slides I skipped over last night that are just two, three slides. Um, oh, but the containers. One last thing on that. We now have a woman who one might call a housewife. We have had many of them in our community who have done big things like stop reactor constructions. And this one just got to digging on these containers. And she's got all these ind industry documents and US federal documents that I understand we have a lot more information available. Um, I will construct a series of links on everything I've been talking about, get it to Jill, she can get it out, so you can have access on the web. But she's been revealing that you cannot inspect these containers because the inspection methodology doesn't work in a high radiation environment because it's radiation. So, uh, hello. <laughs> and, and in the United States, they're using uh, materials for these containers that are known to embrittle with heat and radiation. And they also known to do stress corrosion cracking, especially in marine uh, you know, salty air environments. So Yucca Mountain is salty rock, and there's known water in that mountain. I went inside that tunnel, exploratory tunnel, standing in puddles. It's not a dry place. It's salty. So we got a whole portfolio of issues around what has already been done with the waste, and how can we ensure that day by day by day by day it's contained. And that really is my goal. I can't work on the endpoints of the waste. I won't 
none of us will be around then, but even the policy decisions on whether you bury or whether you store or whatever you do, that's not my lifetime. But we do have to, in our lifetime, ensure that we know where it is, we know whether it's leaking, and if it is leaking, we do something about it. And so this whole new portfolio of issues on containers, I think, is somewhat different with the castors or cast iron. That's maybe better, but it may be worse in some ways. We don't really know. Um, that's the German design. I don't really know about what's being used here in the UK, but we should definitely be trading notes. Because some of these effects of the embrittlement can be on the scale of a decade or two. So, not good. Okay, does anybody have any questions before I move on? Is it the case that in the last year there's been a major collapse of some of these containers and releases that have been uh, probably covered up to some extent? There have been releases from containers, but not of irradiated fuel rods. The one that you're thinking of is in the burial of plutonium waste in, yes. in uh, New Mexico, very near to the site where they want to do surface storage. Um, you finished the slides. Yeah. Uh, so it's called the Waste Isolation Isolation Pilot Plant, WIP, and they put plutonium waste in there with um, kitty litter as an absorptive material. And during the Obama administration, there was a big, huge effort to quote green the federal agencies, which is great. I'm all in favor, but um, somebody decided to start ordering wood chip uh, kitty litter instead of the clay kitty litter. And that little decision by a procurement officer led to explosive conditions inside these containers that had not been there previously. Now, there might have been other reasons to explode. I'm not saying this is the only one, but it's what's been uh, ID'd as the contributing factor in this case of a five, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe it's like $3 billion this kitty litter decision is costing. And the whole thing went stop for any more waste going there for a while, some workers were affected. It, it was a big deal. Okay, so why don't you do this, and if there's any time left, I'll do the um, reactor vessel opening, because this is actually a good prelude. This is definitely a prelude to that. Yeah.